First things first. Gotta rip the band-aid off and admit that from late 2001 to mid-2003 when I was a teenager, I wrote fan fiction and posted it online. My stories weren't that great, but I made friends because I posted them so I don't regret doing it. Even after I stopped posting stories, I was still active online and instead posted fan art and dumb stuff about the role plays I did with my buddies over on DeviantArt. Cringe, cringe. Maybe I sound like a lame fangirl, but whatever. I was having fun. Fast forward to 2008 when I got a private message on DeviantArt that was... Well, I really wasn't expecting online life to take such a strange turn on that particular random day. But, the writer, Aerie, began her missive by informing me, a complete stranger, that she was seriously mentally ill. She listed a wide variety of disorders including schizophrenia which had tormented her all her life. She then said she was scared to write me like this, but that she had to do it so she could move on. Move on from what, you ask? From her hatred of me, of course. Harry wrote that she had hated me for a long time, based on the fan fiction I wrote, because my stories terrified her. Okay. Now, let's be clear here. I wrote stories about characters from cartoons in one comic book. One of the characters from that comic was a violent and terrible person, and I wrote him as such. That's not what was scaring her, no. Harry was scared because she was in love with said violent character, John, and believed they were destined for each other and that he talked to her in her head. And then she read my fanfiction and suddenly John stopped talking to her, and she knew it was because he was talking to me instead. She was absolutely certain that I had stolen her true love from her. She said that after that she developed a belief that I was the arbiter of her reality, more generally. That is a direct quote, I will never forget that phrase and that I was capable of reaching into her mind and not only reading, but taking away her precious thoughts. This caused her so much anguish and suffering. However, she went on, deep down she also knew this was a delusion caused by her mental illness. Harry closed her private message by begging me to respond to her, to confirm that I was just a normal girl, so she could get past this trauma I had caused her and be happy again. Now. I have to again rip off a band-aid of inviting judgment here by admitting that sometimes I am a complete idiot. I am also a soft-hearted person and the idea that someone could have been harmed by the goofy stuff that I posted years earlier made me kinda sad. So I did a soft-hearted but ultimately stupid thing and responded, yes yes I was a normal teenage girl when I posted that stuff and now I am a normal early 20s woman with no mind stealing superpowers. Also, I don't know you and had no idea you existed until you sent me this, so how could I have singled you out to hurt you with my fanfics? Please don't worry about me. And I thought, what a kind person I am, and surely that will be the end of it. Wrong. Every replied to me using a different upbeat and cheerful tone, saying she was so glad I wrote back to her because now she knew she didn't have to fear me and we could just be friends. She loved my fanfics, honestly. And by the way, what was my real name so she could find me on Facebook? Uh, excuse me? No. An idiot I may be, but I ain't that stupid. I told her I didn't have a Facebook, a lie, and was busy with school. A truth, so I wouldn't be on DeviantArt a whole lot. A half-truth. But I wished her good luck with her mental health recovery and hoped she would have a good life. A truth, I mean... So far, she just seemed troubled and weird, but I wouldn't have wished harm on her. I didn't get a response to that. But, a few months later, I got a deviant art private message from another account I didn't know that simply asked, Hey, how do you get your characters to talk for you? Now, I hadn't posted any fan fiction for years, but I was still participating in fandom and talked online about writing and I honestly thought this question was about writing, specifically dialogue. I mulled over how to respond and ended up not answering right away. I went back to my private messages a few days later and saw I had another new message. This one saying with a lot of exclamation points and cry type style misspellings that I had to answer and teach this stranger how to talk to my characters, 
and that I didn't know how long this user had suffered because of me. Oh my goodness, I wonder who it was using another account. And guess what? I was still an idiot. So I answered the first message, but sort of detachedly ignored the desperation of the second message and just kind of giving tips for how to learn a character's voice and how to write dialogue for them. Once again, I got a very chipper reply, including the confession that, yeah, it was Ari, and that she just loved talking to me and thought I was so nice and such a good friend to be patient with her and answer her burning questions about how to talk to my, yes, specifically my, characters. Because, you see, she had realized that she was not just in love with John, but with my John, from a stupid fan fiction. And now she could talk to him anytime because we were friends. I got the idea that she was not asking to roleplay and instead thought she would be able to communicate directly with this once removed fictional character now. But I feigned ignorance and said something like, Ah, uh, our roleplay group is kind of private and not accepting new members, but I hope I answered your question and please have a good day. Because, see, I did not really want to be friends with someone who A, seemed to believe I was somehow responsible for her mental illness and health despite not knowing her from Adam and having only spoken to her twice, and B, had already told me once that she hated me and thought that I could control her reality. On the kinder side of things, I honestly didn't think continuing a conversation would be good for either of our comforts. On the meaner side, I just really, really didn't want to interact with this person anymore, and I felt like I had already done more than enough to help this stranger. Okay, so she stopped responding to me, and I thought this strange interlude in my life was over. Wrong. Now fast forward seven entire years to early July 2015, at which time I had moved my main online presence to Tumblr. I had left a note on my DeviantArt account in 2011 when I moved, giving my new Tumblr screen name so my fandom buddies could easily find me. At this point, I had not posted any fanfiction for over a decade. I also was not talking much at all online about John, except to reblog the occasional posts someone else made about the comic he was from, as you do on Tumblr. Suddenly, I received an anonymous ask. And that ask said in no uncertain terms that I was the cause of Asker's suffering because I had callously disregarded others' feelings. It closed with some kind of weird threat. I can't remember exactly what now because I instinctively deleted the ask due to being unnerved. I guess it could be airy, based on the typing style and the fact that there couldn't be two people in the world who think I make them suffer, right? But it had been seven years, so I wasn't entirely sure. And then I did yet another stupid thing. I made a post that said something along the lines of, To the Anon that just sent me a vaguely threatening ask, Sorry if anything I've posted has upset you. Please let me know if I can tag my post a certain way so you can block whatever content you find distressing. A couple of days later, I got another Anon ask calling me a prattling, ostentatious idiot. Direct quote, and saying it doesn't work that way and strong emotions cannot just be blocked. The message went on, you stole him away from me and I have been living in turmoil since and you don't care. Ah uh, yes, definitely airy. There was no question about it. After all, I haven't stolen anyone else's fictional boyfriend that I know of. I turned off anonymous ass. I also went back to my old untouched deviant art account where I found a comment on my front page from yet a third account there that said, If you still talk to him, tell him that I love him and that I always will. He was the first man I ever loved and it was your version of him I loved above all. I have been jealous, angry at you, anger at myself, depressed and psychotic. I tore myself to shreds over him and my art aches and cries. The first cut is the deepest. I love you, John. The date on this message was June 28, 2015, just a few days before the first Anon ask on Tumblr. I did a little internet sleuthing, just a simple Google of various known usernames, and found her Fur Affinity account, where she had posted screeds in her journal about hating anyone else who wrote or drew anything about John. Okay, 
I also discovered through this Google search that I was not completely special in triggering Ares' ire, and that she also had gone after another person on Tumblr in much the same way, demanding answers to emotionally charged ass, assuming friendship where there wasn't any, and then stalking the person using multiple accounts and email addresses and accusing them of harming her. This other person had amassed a collection of screenshots of Ares' behavior, and it was really super not good. Anyway, I figured since I blocked a non ass, maybe she'd just go away. Wrong. Ares' next wave of stuff began in 2016 when someone started reblogging my personal text posts with cryptid comments like, You have a beautiful soul. The username was nothing like Ari or any of the other account names she'd used before, so I just thought that someone was being socially awkward. But after a few months of this, I received a message from this account through Tumblr's chat function that let the cat out of the bag. This person said something like, I'm a British female creature with, insert same litany of mental illnesses from Aries' first PM in 2008, and I'm so scared of dying alone and friendless. I used to read your fanfiction and it always made me feel better. I think you're an amazing woman and would like to get to know you better. Please, I'm begging you. Don't let me alone in the dark. Well, this sure sounded a lot like Aerie to me. This was confirmed when I went to the person's Tumblr and saw that they had recently posted something passive-aggressive about that other Tumblr user Aerie was known to stalk. And if that wasn't enough, they had also had a lot of weird innuendo-laden posts about John and a couple of other characters, including Sherlock and a man I didn't recognize, and they claimed to have legally married. It was at this point that I finally decided to stop being a soft-hearted idiot. I blocked the account that sent me the chat message right away without responding. Over the next several months, Ari attempted to contact others on Tumblr who it was obvious I had talked to a lot. My girlfriend, our best friend. She sent them chat messages like the one paraphrased above. Hilarious in the case of my girlfriend who had never wrote any fanfiction begging for their friendship and also, you know, just casually asking what I was doing, whether they could get to talk to her and that sort of thing. I know my girlfriend and BFF blocked her too after they asked me who this person was and I told them the whole story. I also discovered that on Tumblr you can choose an option to allow chat messages only from people you follow. With that account blocked and no one I don't follow able to send me chat messages, I naively thought again that surely this weird nonsense would end. Wrong. See, the thing about Tumblr, if you're not familiar with the website, is that if you block someone, they just can't interact with your posts or follow you. A block causes someone to auto-unfollow you and they won't see your posts on their dash feed. They also won't be able to send you ass. However, they can still go to your actual blog username.tumblr.com and see everything you post. If they try to interact with any of your posts or your blog, reply, reblog, like, they won't be able to, which will of course tip them off to that you had blocked them. Beginning in 2018, Ari engaged in a whirlwind of activity. She made a new account and sent me an ask, or 15, saying things from various, please talk to me, I'm harmless, you don't know how hard it is to be me, to I'm so scared of the darkness, to humans are social animals and I'm dying without you, to I guess you like psychos like John but can't handle a real psycho like me, to I want to kidnap you from far away in a happy ending, my darling. So I blocked that account immediately. She made a new account and reblogged some posts I'd make a while back about John's comic book with the comment like, My first love. The first cut is the deepest, before sending me multiple asks, all saying, You stole him from me. So I blocked that account immediately. So she made another one, made some meme generator, sparkly pictures of rats and spiders with text like, I just want to sit next to you and be your friend. I'm not scary. And would post them with my at username so this mention would show up on my Dash's activity feed. So I blocked that account. So she made a new account, posted a quote from my favorite author, well-known info I post about him frequently, 
and sent me a couple of asks saying that this author would disagree with how I was treating her by continuing to block and shun her friendship when she was harmless and just thought I was an amazing person. So I blocked that account. Mate, did you forget you called me a prattling, ostentatious idiot and threatened me? Because I sure haven't. This went on for ten accounts, one of which had the blog title in huge letters at the top. Hello, my nickname reserved only for close friends. One of which she inundated with photos of herself glaring at the camera. My first looks at her face, and I don't like to judge people in appearance, but this girl has a really creepy glare, and also looks like she has not showered in weeks. Adding me in each one, she only ever used one of these accounts to actually post, reblog, and like things from other people like a seemingly normal person, albeit one who made some questionable comments sometimes. All the rest only existed to bother me. I started trying to report her to Tumblr after the third or fourth time for making multiple accounts solely to evade my blocks. But if you know anything about Tumblr, you can guess they didn't respond with more than an automated, okay, we'll look into this, in the meantime, have you tried blocking this user? Anyway, throughout 2018, I just had to deal with the fact that any time I saw the little red flag above my ask box icon, it would probably be something creepy, either threatening or passive-aggressive from Aerie that would put me on edge for a few hours and remind me that no matter what I do on Tumblr, she can read everything I post. I haven't gotten anything from her so far in 2019, but I figured as long as she's out there, there's always that chance that she'll come back. Maybe not right away, maybe not until another ten years from now, but let me just say, Aerie... You weirdo. I'm genuinely sorry about your mental illnesses and hope you get help for them. But while they may explain some of your behavior, they don't excuse it. I am not and never will be your friend because you are not harmless. You made me heavily curtail my social interaction on Tumblr by cutting off a couple of methods of communication that could have been used to make new friends. You made me worried about ever talking there about a comic I enjoy. You made it so any time I see I have an ask, my heart rate goes up because it might be more of your disturbing nonsense. You've harassed my loved ones and also other strangers who probably didn't do anything to deserve it. I don't control your reality, but if I did, you can bet I'd use that power to ensure we'd never meet. My first day moving into student halls, I was greeted by a very friendly guy called Dominic. He was very camp and told me he was gay early in the conversation, but I didn't have a problem with that. He offered to help me unpack in my room, then go for a drink with me. Although I thought this was a little over-familiar, I was delighted that I had made a friend so quickly and accepted his offer. He put a tremendous amount of effort into helping me put everything in the appropriate places in my room. We then went for a drink at the student bar. I made a point to tell him I was straight as I suspected that he might have a bit of a crush on me, hence why he was being so nice. However, he didn't show any signs of dismay and continued chatting with me. I liked him a lot. He was very intelligent and interesting to talk to, and I was very pleased that I had a new friend already. I was worried that I'd be lonely in the uni dorms. He didn't live in the same building as me, he just lived across. I was studying creative writing and he was studying business, but we started to hang out a lot. Although I liked Dominic, I did start to find him a little overbearing. He would send me texts and message me on Facebook all the time, and would get upset if I didn't reply, even if it was only for about five minutes. He would always want to know what I was doing, and if I disappeared off of Facebook for a while, he would want to know where I'd been all day. One time, I even sent him a text mentioning I was on a train, and he texted me back, Why are you on a train? Why am I not invited to wherever you're going? I was on my way to my part-time job. I made quite a few other friends, and he would always show visible signs of displeasure whenever they were around, and whenever I talked to him about them, he would tell me he disliked them and that I shouldn't trust them. He was very possessive, and I personally can't stand clingy friends, so I tried to distance myself from him a bit, but the more I pulled away, the tighter he held. 
I still hung out with him and still cared about him, but I was starting to worry about where this friendship was going. I was pretty sure this guy had a crush on me, and soon my suspicions were confirmed. I met this girl at a party I went to called Anna and asked her out on a date. She accepted. I was really thrilled and told Dominic about it. The second I told him, his face fell. Why are you going on a date with her? He asked me, sounding very worried. Uh, because I want to? I said. But I'm going to be jealous, he said. Please don't go. It'll really hurt me. You wouldn't want to hurt me. I'm your best friend. I had never actually told him he was my best friend before, and I found the way he was acting now both annoying and a little creepy. I'm sorry, but I told you I was straight before Dominic, I said. I mean, we can still be friends, but I'm not going to stop dating just for you. He remained sulky and miserable the rest of the night. I told myself that he'd have to accept it and get over it soon. But when I was on the date with Anna, I kept getting phone calls from unknown numbers. I answered at first, but I couldn't hear anything on the other end. It was just as though someone was listening. I started to ignore the calls, but you would not believe how frequently they were coming in. They were coming in non-stop, and I couldn't even tell the time because they were seriously not stopping. I had to put my phone on airplane mode. After about an hour of my phone in airplane mode, I switched airplane mode off. But the very second I did, the calls came in again. Although I was unnerved, I enjoyed my date with Anna and we agreed to meet up again. When I got home from the date, Dominic was waiting right outside my dorm, his phone in hand. How was your date? Do you like her? He asked, sounding miserable. Yeah, I do. I told him. Was that, like, you who kept calling me, or... No, he said, but he was obviously lying. But anyway, I've been waiting to tell you, I hear Anna's, like, super promiscuous. She sleeps around with loads of guys, and you should stay away, dude. She'll break your heart. Anna had no mutual connections with Dominic, so I asked him how he could possibly know about this. He just told me he'd done his research. I was angered and told him it was none of his business and that I'd find out for myself. He started crying, saying how he was just worried about me and stormed off. I think he was hoping I'd follow him, but I didn't and went to my room, angry that he would try to interfere with my life like this. I've had unrequited crushes on friends before, but if they don't feel the same, I never try to force it, but Dominic only got worse. When I got back to my student room, Dominic had sent me screenshots on Facebook of a conversation he had allegedly had with Anna. The messages showed her boasting to him about how she was using me and how she was planning to break my heart. Obviously, this didn't ring at all true as, one, how would she even know who Dominic was and why would she message him, and two, why would she tell a friend of mine so openly what her plans for me were and when he would obviously show me. I demanded that he show me the conversation from Anna on his computer screen with me there, but he told me that he had deleted the conversations because they were too upsetting for him to read. I knew right there and then that Dominic was deliberately trying to ruin my relationship with Anna through incredibly deceitful and despicable means, and I told him that I wasn't interested in him, that I never would be, and that he'd better stop right now. He told me that I was being a terrible friend that all he was doing was trying to look out for me and that he couldn't believe I was believing a stranger over him. I was so angry with the way he was selfishly trying to manipulate me now and blocked him on all social media. He started sending me constant texts and calling me non-stop every day, telling me things like he was so depressed over me and that he started taking heroin and that he was contemplating ending his life, basically trying to make me worry. He would also constantly send me texts saying he knew Anna was cheating on me. Me and her started dating properly and that I had to come to my senses. He was creeping me out so much that I went to stay with my parents for a bit as I wasn't comfortable in living in the same area as him. I had to block his number because the phone calls were so constant. People from my uni dorm were sending me angry messages because Dominic had told them a really twisted version of what was going on 
making them think that Anna was dirty, STD-ridden, who I had betrayed him for. It then turned out that he had been lying to everyone, telling them that me and him were in a romantic relationship and that I had cheated on him with Anna, then left him for her. I previously set everyone straight, told them that I had never been in a relationship with Dominic, and that everything he told them about Anna was nonsense. Most people believe me, although it took a while to convince everyone that Dominic was a liar. He was very manipulative, and although a lot of his lies were ludicrous, he was very good at making himself sound legit. I decided to go back to my uni dorm after a while, as it was inconvenient for me to stay at my parents' while at uni. Their house was far away from it. I arrived back there quite late as I really didn't want to run into Dominic. I was so angry about him. I had a new girlfriend and studies to think about, yet because of his obsession and harassment, he was now all I could think about. In a very twisted way, I think this is what he wanted, positively or negatively, he wanted me thinking about him. When I got back, I just lay down on my bed thinking about what to do when suddenly, smash, a brick came flying through my window. I jumped a mile and rolled over the side of my bed, hiding there for a moment, thinking it was burglars coming in or something, but nothing more happened. Once I got over the shock, I cautiously stepped over the broken glass and tried to look out of the window when I got a phone call of a number I didn't recognize. I answered it, and it was Dominic, and you will not believe what he said. I just saw Anna throw a brick through your window and run, he shouted. I told you she was bad news. You should have listened to me. I told you. You would not believe the rage I felt. I was so angry I couldn't even speak for a moment. But then I just exploded. I screamed at him that I knew it was him and I was calling the police right now. He tried to protest, but I hung up on him and immediately called them. When they arrived, Dominic was not in his room, but when it was opened up, a large stash of illegal drugs was found there. The manager of my student's hall assured me that he'd be getting kicked out for this and the police said that they would be getting in touch with him. After this, I never saw Dominic again. I changed my phone number and never unblocked him on social media. A couple of times I was tempted out of sheer curiosity but decided it wasn't worth it. I think he dropped out of uni but I don't know exactly what happened to him. My relationship with Anna didn't last. She was never quite clear on why she ended it, but I actually suspect that Dominic's freakish behavior scared her off, even though it wasn't my fault. Oh well, life goes on. Dominic, I hope whatever issues you're going through, you sort them out, and I hope you find a guy who actually does want to be with you, because please, I never do. My parents are divorced, and I live primarily in Australia, but travel back to see my father, his family, and my extended family in the UK every chance I can spare. This story revolves around one of these visits. At the time of the visit, I was 13 years old, and due to scheduling conflicts, would be traveling alone without any other sibling. Luckily, most airlines and airports worth their salt offer assistance programs for unaccompanied minors. That program includes an identifying tag escorts throughout the airport, help with check-in and priority boarding. I was boarded first, my chaperone said goodbye and handed me off to flight attendants. So far, so good. Nothing of any real significance happened for the first few hours of the flight, but I couldn't help but feel a little uneasy. I kept feeling this sensation like someone was watching me, but every time I glanced around I couldn't see the source. I chalked it up to being a little nervous about flying alone and trying to watch some in-flight movies to calm myself down. The next significant event was when I got up to pee. Now something caught my eye that hadn't before. There was a man about four rows back in a middle aisle seat who was staring at me. He wasn't making much attempt to hide the fact that he was looking at me and out of shyness I just looked down and broke our stare and tried to ignore him. As I walked by, I almost felt like he was gesturing to me to look at him, as if he wanted to ask me a question. In that moment, I made the decision to ignore him and pretend I hadn't seen him gesture to me. 
My mother has always been very safety conscious, and I credit her with giving me a healthy superstition of strangers. She had made it very clear that while I was traveling alone, I didn't have to answer to any other adults but my chaperones, and that if someone tried to talk to me or make me do something for them, I had permission to ignore them or report them to airport staff. So that's what I did. I walked past him, went to the bathroom, and walked back to my seat with my head down. I can't verify whether or not he kept trying to get my attention because I was a little freaked out to look back. All I can say is that my creepy, you're being watched senses kept on tingling as the flight went on. These bad feelings all came to a head during the sleeping hours on the flight. For those who haven't traveled international long hauls, the sleeping hours are for people to sleep by simulating nighttime in the plane. This means no trolley service, dimmed lights, and all the airline screens are shut off. I was very groggy and sleep deprived at the time. I probably should have tried to get some rest, but I couldn't get comfortable and was just trying to ride out my time watching movies. This is when he approached me. He put a hand on my shoulder and squeezed, and then he said something that I didn't hear with my headphones on. I removed them and turned to give him my groggy but full attention. Sorry? Will you come back to the back of the plane with me, please? Utterly confused by this question, have I done something? No. I would just like you to come back to the back of the plane with me. He crouched down to be at eye level with me. Glancing back to the end of the plane, which is dark, behind a curtain and the only bathroom is vacant. Uh, I have money. He pulls out a wallet and shows me a wad of cash. If you like some, I just want to talk to you at the back of the plane. It'll just be a moment. I'm very confused as to what to do when this is happening. Looking back, I remember feeling annoyed, less afraid of danger and more irritated at being asked to stop watching a movie and do something. Due to my tired state, it wasn't connecting that I might be in danger. I was just being asked to talk to this guy about something. I wonder if he might have convinced me with a little more prodding, but luckily he didn't get any further. A woman behind me, who I realized later was listening in for the entire conversation, pulled down her eye mask, leant over between the seat gap and said, She isn't interested. You need to return to your seat right now or I'll call for the flight attendant. I have never seen a man move so fast. He tucked his wallet away and scurried back to his seat, slid on his eye mask and rotated away from us so we wouldn't see his face. She turned her attention to me and says, If he comes back over, you wake me up or call for the flight attendant. If you need to use the bathroom, use the one in the center of the plane. It's more well lit. And she reaches through and rests a hand on my shoulder. I give a thank you and she leans back in her seat but keeps her eye mask off, shooting looks in the man's direction. Near the last few hours of the flight, I didn't feel uneasy or like I was being watched anymore. The woman, who was traveling with her two kids, keeps leaning in and asking me more questions about where I'm going, who is picking me up from the airport. When she discovers that I'm meeting extended family at the terminal, her face clears and she offers to walk out with me to the baggage claim. We land, get off the plane, and when I saw my father in the arrivals lounge, I wave her a fond goodbye say thank you, and walk off. As for the guy, I have no idea what happened. The encounter was so bizarre and short that I might have just disregarded it from my memory immediately. Looking back, though, I always feel apprehension and dread at what his intentions were. I have some theories, but I'm glad I didn't get put in a position to find out. To the woman who saved me, you're my hero, and I only wish I could thank you properly for looking out for me. My sister has been married for several years, but this is the first time she genuinely felt unsafe in her own home. Her husband was finishing up school and they had just had a baby, so she was pretty sleep deprived. She had gotten sick and my brother-in-law wanted her to get some decent rest, so she stayed with the baby in the living room in the nursery to take care of her while my sister slept. My parents wanted to see the baby, so my brother-in-law came over to our house for a bit and just let my sister rest. It should be noted that my brother-in-law is extremely paranoid, even though we live in a low-crime area. 
He's from a sketchy Midwestern town, though, so it does make sense. So he makes sure the doors and windows are locked before leaving, and half wakes up my sister to let her know he's going to her house with the baby and that he'll pick up some dinner on the way back. My sister sleepily agrees and falls back to sleep. Fast forward, a couple of hours later, my sister has to wake up to breastfeed and pump because her chest is starting to hurt. She prolongs this and tosses and turns for a while because she was still exhausted and didn't want to get up. When she starts coming to, she realizes the house is super cold. Once she actually opens her eyes, she hears the front door shutting, but she's super out of it. Assuming it's her husband, she calls out his name, but gets no answer. The room is pitch black and all of the other lights in the house are off so she can't see anything. Suddenly she gets a really horrible feeling that she can only describe as stepping into a freezing shower. She gets up and checks the thermostat which was fine. She assumes she just feels cold because she's sick. She turns on some lights and does a quick turn around the house and realizes no one else is home and the front door is locked. This obviously freaks her out and she texts her husband to ask when he'll be home. He gets home not long after, they have dinner and he stays with the baby in the living room and sleeps on the couch. My sister notices that one of the windows in the bedroom is open and she says she doesn't remember opening it but that would explain why she was so cold earlier. Her husband makes sure to check that all of the windows are shut and... The door is locked after my sister explains to him the weird feeling she got earlier. Later, she wakes up at around 2am to pump and that disgusting feeling creeps up again. She shoots up out of bed and can barely make out someone standing at the foot of her bed. She thinks it's her husband, similar height and build, so she asks him to bring her some water while she's prepping to pump. The figure doesn't move or speak. She repeats herself and in what she describes as the most terrifying moment of her life, he answers her. No, no. Go back to sleep. I like to watch you sleep. The voice definitely does not belong to my brother-in-law. She turns on her side desk lamp and starts screaming at this creeper wearing all black. He just starts giggling. Her husband jolts out of his sleep and she scrambles for the knife she has in her table and the dude just books it out the window. He had opened it and climbed through. She knows for sure that he was watching her sleep earlier when she was napping and that it was probably him that she had seen shutting the bedroom door earlier. They call the police and file a report and nothing really comes of it because he technically didn't do anything besides trespassing because they said they couldn't be sure if they could charge him with breaking and entering because my sister doesn't remember if she opened the window or not. Idiots. They have no idea he didn't injure himself when he jumped out the window because when my brother-in-law ran out the back to give chase, he had already disappeared. It's been a few years and nothing really ever came of the investigation, and they had the windows and locks replaced. So a few years ago, I was coming back to work after taking some time off after an operation. I left a regional role for a contract one that meant a lot less traveling. It meant leaving a job I loved, but meant I could remain in transport facilities management at a senior level. For a while, it was great, but this was nothing like my previous role, and I meet an engineering supervisor, James. He was super helpful and 28 years older than me. It started with friendly wanting to sit together over lunch and taking breaks the same time as me. I like to think I was a good manager, and so would bring coffee in for the guys on a Friday, but I did this randomly at all the sites, so sometimes coffee and sometimes pizza. Then when I was coming through the garage, he'd stop me in front of all the other engineers and hug me. They'd make jokes about how sweet it was as he was an older guy and they all thought it was sweet. I pulled one of the other managers aside. Don't you think it's a bit full on? I was 30 at the time and just felt like he was a little too friendly, yet I was trying to fit in. This guy just says to me, he's an old man, lighten up. He started to follow me around the depot. Guys started drawing hearts on his coffee cups and it just became a huge joke. 
I carried my own phone plus a company one and he'd text quite late, asking if I was having a good night. Was I out with my friends and such? All pretty harmless, but after 12 months of being there, I nipped it on a Saturday and was trying to catch up on work and he came in. Said he'd seen my car and wanted to know if I wanted company. Stayed a while and said, I'll be coming out for drinks next week. I had said, Oh, I think it was just the management team going. And he said, Yeah, but I checked in with the director Dick and he says a few engineers are coming too. That night he touched me, declared that he and his disabled wife no longer had intimate relations and basically he thought we should hook up. I was taken aback, said no, left and told my husband, who said basically he told me so. I had been telling him all along it was a bit creepy how fond he was and the guys were taking the mick. I approached my director and explained that he asked if I was on my period to be this moody about banter. I started working from the other sites more and stopped going to for drinks with colleagues as everyone kept saying how much happier he was, how it was just a crush. One time I left a meeting and he went, I'll jump in the car with you, as the others all split. I tried to disagree but the others said that they were heading to another site so we should just go together. Other times he sent me pictures and told me he loved me. I didn't see the point in reporting this as it's a boys club and my director had made it clear I needed to suck it up. It was becoming harder and harder as I couldn't block his number because it was a work phone. I hated going into work and the rumors were fueled by him. The final straw was when he turned up in the full kilt getup where myself and my girls were having a drink and joined us. My husband was going mad and I said I would leave. It just wasn't worth it. There were other issues with this company and I knew I wasn't going to be staying. I took some time off over Christmas and I could bore you with the other ways he'd made my life terrible. I would do inspections and end up trapped in the pit with him. He agreed to run a charity run I was doing so we'd be away overnight together so I pulled out. I got a job offer from a smaller company with a guy who ran it being a belter. He was also family and all about the engineering. Although this was a huge pay cut and losing my car I was seriously considering it. I returned January and got pulled in by the director. I sit down and start to explain to him how well we had done how well the staff were that I had just finished the contract bid and got it signed. He cut me off and told me that there had been a complaint. James's wife had contacted HR and told them I had booked hotels on my company card and had nights away with her husband and all kinds of crazy stuff. She was sobbing on the phone and the director said that I was going to be investigated. There was also an allegation of handling stolen goods and that I had alcohol on site. I could have cried. They carried out their investigation and he decided he would ignore me, be rude and dismissive to me in front of staff and generally go on like a horrid person. I waited for an insurance team to come and breathalyze me and carry out drug tests. The investigation showed I hadn't been drinking and the supervisor that gave me the wine as a gift for my husband helping him with his decorating stuck up for me. Also most of the management team and engineers who worked for me didn't go to bat for me but Still, I handed my notice in. He didn't speak to me at work, but then the messages started. His wife had found me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. She was messaging my husband and all kinds of things. At first, I tried to ignore it as I had a leave date for three weeks' time and just thought I would be away from this nightmare soon. Then she stepped it up and contacted my future employer, meaning the director had mentioned to someone where I was going. My new employer was amazing and told me to contact the police. I think I just wanted to stop being embarrassed, so hadn't even thought about that, so I did call the police. They said they couldn't really do a lot as they hadn't threatened me, and I sobbed telling them I could prove where I was when I was supposedly with her husband. The officer was amazing and said what he could do was go and have a word. It then got super crazy and his daughter sent me and my husband messages. These were threats and the officer went back out. Then it all went quiet. One of the guys from my old job contacted me and said, You know, he was seeing someone else. When he got caught and she saw the messages he had sent to you, he didn't want to admit to yet another, so he said yeah. 
He could have full blown up my entire life, and I know now at 33 I wouldn't take this kind of nonsense again. I still work for the family guy, but I am super careful. I don't go for drinks when the team do, and I don't joke with them and probably come across like a doll idiot, but I don't want to ever meet him or cause that situation again. I know there were things I could have done differently, and there are so many things I missed out. He was nuts. I'm grateful I left with my reputation intact. James was technically working for the client, which is probably why the director just wanted it to go away. I have grown up in South Africa my entire life and live in a generally safe area. Any medical professionals in South Africa, doctors, physicians, have to complete a year of community service where the government places you in most likely a rural area where you are expected to work in a public facility and around the community. So being a medical professional, I moved to another province, equivalent to a state in South Africa, for a year to complete my community service. I won't mention the area, but it is considered more rural than the regular South Africa city. Needless to say, not living there for a very long time, I wasn't always sure which hangout spots were considered safe and which I should rather avoid. Fast forward a few months into living in the new province, my boyfriend came to visit me. We drove around and noticed a huge park enclosed by a fence. There were tons of families walking around in the grass, barbecuing, sitting on benches, etc., we thought it looked pretty safe. So we chose a spot on the bench and sat down to talk. My boyfriend still lived back home, so we were doing the distance thing. I was sad that he was leaving again in two days and started crying. He calmed me down and we sat looking at the people walking around. Next thing we know, there are two guys walking from about 20 meters away, looking straight towards us. They looked extremely sketchy, clothes mismatched and torn in the typical gangster walk. We thought they might walk past us, but they literally walked straight up to us, and being from South Africa, my boyfriend and I both had a bad feeling about the encounter to come. They approached us. We froze in place, and instead of getting up and walking away, we just sat there. One of these gangsters, covered in gang tattoos, crouched down next to me while the other one went around to my boyfriend and stood close next to him. The idiot on my side had weird bandages or some type of white glove on his hand. They asked us if we could help them with some money because they got out of jail yesterday. We said we don't have it, but they were persistent and wouldn't leave us alone. I started freaking out at this point because I'd been robbed before and I knew their persistent behavior could and probably would escalate to violence. They told us that they didn't want to hurt us, but just wanted money or whatever else we have to give. My boyfriend realized this too and took out his brand new phone, at the time a OnePlus 5, in the hopes that they would leave us alone. They took the phone and glanced it over a few times. The brand is not common in South Africa and because they couldn't recognize it, they said they didn't want the phone. They kept surrounding us and walking behind us and crouching down, which I assume was so that the other people around us don't see them. I tried to hide my car keys in my pocket because I was scared that they'd try to take the car as they kept looking at my pockets. I didn't know what to do, so I just kept crying. I told the gangsters that we just found out my boyfriend's dad passed away and can they not see that we are very upset. Luckily, as said before, I was already crying before they arrived so it didn't seem like a lie. Then... The one on my boyfriend's side's demeanor immediately changed and he apologized and gave us condolences. Really? The other gangster crouching beside me didn't seem to care and reached into his pocket. At this point, I was very sure something bad would happen, like he would pull out a gun or a knife if we didn't leave, so I grabbed my boyfriend's hand and tried to run away. They just stood there watching us and luckily didn't follow. For anyone wondering, South Africa's crime rate is very high, one of the highest in the world, and while most areas are safe, you can never escape situations like this. For anyone thinking we might have been prejudiced because they didn't actually do anything, I can promise you that when you see a South African gangster, you will know. They are also known for being cold and ruthless, so I'm glad we made it out of there unharmed. I don't want to know what could have happened if we didn't get out of there. 
when we did. I was working in a large assisted living facility for a few years. I absolutely loved my job. I worked with the elderly mostly, but I had become a highly requested assistant and got moved around to the dementia ward, the short-term rehab ward, the stroke ward, all over the place. Being a people person, I loved it. I liked going the extra mile in my job and getting to know my patients and their families on a more personal level. I felt like it made me a better CNA. It wasn't uncommon for me to be assigned to the more difficult patients because I could typically handle them no problem. It was a regular day. My charge nurse had mentioned that we would be getting a few new admins and I didn't think much of it. Everything went routinely and we got them all settled into their rooms and stuff. One person in particular was already being a handful and tried to escape a few times, so we needed to move him to the security unit. I could hear him yelling and cussing out everyone, telling them they were idiots and that it was unnecessary to be doing all of this. A few of the nurses suggested I go try to calm him down, so of course I said yes. I put on my most charming smile and waltzed on over asking him what was wrong. He immediately took a liking to me and calmed down. He told me that nobody there knew how to do their job and he wanted some food already. I told him dinner would be served soon and I'd make sure to bring his tray to him. He cooperated with everyone as long as I was around and took his meds, took a shower, settled into bed no problem. Once my shift was over though, he started acting up again and he ended up needing one-on-one supervision. Different staff members would take turns monitoring him and eventually I had to. It was an easy day's work. Get him an ice cream here and there, watch some TV... I didn't mind it at all. He told me about his life and asked about mine. Mostly if I liked what I do and how come I never worked in the security unit. I told him that I usually had my own group of patients in the front that I had to look after, but I'd make an effort to drop in and see him when I could. At first the rest of the staff thought it was great. They would call for me if he started acting out and everything was fine. But then he started getting a little too attached. He started saying he wouldn't do anything unless I was there at all times, which of course I couldn't do since I was needed elsewhere. While I floated to different wards, the secured unit was one of the ones I spent the least amount of time in. He started getting mad at me, saying I needed to make more of an effort to see him, and that I wasn't trying hard enough. I explained to him that technically he wasn't my patient, and I couldn't spend my entire work shift just hanging out with him. That's when things started getting really bad. He started lashing out more, yelling and screaming at everyone. He was becoming violent with not only the staff, but other patients. He was a liability. I had to drop something off in the secured unit one day, and one of the other CNAs told me he was asking for me. So I popped my head in, and he started saying things like, There's my girl. I felt uneasy, but remained calm on the outside. If he was in a good mood, then... I didn't want to be the one to ruin it for everyone else. He gave me a huge hug and kissed me on the cheek, immediately making me feel queasy. I kind of laughed it off and got myself out of there as quickly as possible. After that, I avoided the secured unit at all costs. He started telling the nurses he wanted only me to take care of him, and when they said that wasn't possible because that wasn't my ward, he started going to my bosses and the heads of the faculty saying he wanted me to look after him only. Luckily, my bosses had my back and told him that there was no way I could be assigned back there due to my high demand in other wards. I was already running all over the place and the secured unit was completely out of my way. He didn't like hearing that and started threatening everyone, saying that they would be sorry and this wasn't the end of that and so on. My bosses called me into the office as soon as I walked into work the next day and explained that I wasn't allowed anywhere near that wing and to avoid any contact with him. I had no problem with this and went about my day. He would start banging on the doors to the secured unit demanding to be let out and saying he needed to see me. My anxiety was through the roof and I had even called out a few times because I didn't want to see him. The facility was working fast to get him out of there because... They had reason to believe I could possibly be in danger with his violent behavior. 
On top of all that, it didn't help that some of the other staff members were whispering behind my back saying that I had let this all happen and I was always flirting with him and a bunch of other ugly things. Eventually they got him discharged and I felt a huge weight lifted off my shoulders. Other than people still talking about me behind my back, I felt like I could get back to doing my job properly. I didn't let the negative and disgusting comments change the way I treated my patients with open arms and an open heart. Things started to go back to normal, or so I thought. On one of my days off, I got a call from my coworker. She told me that he had called the facility asking for me. She told him that I wasn't in for work that day, and he started to ask for my schedule. I dealt with someone stalking me before, so I immediately started to shut down. She told me that she had already informed her boss and that I should go to the heads of the facility when I came back to work the next day, so I did. I expressed my feelings and told them it made me nervous that he called for me and the head of the facility's face fell. She told me that it wasn't just the one time he had called. They were receiving phone calls non-stop from him asking when I would be in and that if they didn't tell him my schedule he was going to go over there himself to find out. We had to make a plan of action in case he did show up and they even suggested changing me to a different shift time because he knew I worked mid-afternoon and evenings. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere by myself and had to be picked up and dropped off at work. While I waited for my ride, I had to wait inside the building and have someone escort me in and out. The calls continued and finally they had to threaten legal action and had a huge meeting with the entire staff of the facility. I felt humiliated and small, knowing all the whispers and snide comments would come flooding back, but luckily I had more support than hate. The calls eventually started to slow down and my true friends at work stood up for me when I wasn't there to defend myself to the people who didn't believe me. I started to get back into my normal routine once again and started feeling like my old perky self. Once my bosses called me into the office one day with a big smile on her face and told me, he won't be bothering you anymore, he's in jail for violating parole. I was over the moon, I felt like I could breathe again. My nightmare was finally coming to an end. A month or so later-ish, this was a while ago so I can't remember exactly how long, I was at work getting people ready for bed and suddenly everyone started talking and whispering like crazy. My phone was ringing off the hook so I finally took a call from one of my charge nurses. She told me that apparently he had been murdered in jail and to check out the article she sent me. I learned he had an incredibly violent history including child abuse, neglect, and other unspeakable things, domestic abuse and robbery, to name a few others. My bosses asked how I was feeling and I told them that I couldn't say I was the least bit sad and I wasn't surprised his temper and mouth got him in some trouble. I left that facility since then, moved on to bigger things and I sleep soundly at night knowing someone like that can never bother anyone again. This first started when I went to a summer camp in my junior year of high school and I met this girl. Her name is Mar. I introduced myself to Mar and then for the rest of the six weeks I probably talked to her a total of three times, which includes my introduction, the time she locked me and my friend into a room, and when I said goodbye when the camp ended. She seemed really nice and I thought she was extremely sweet. Fast forward a year, I get a text out of nowhere saying, Hey, I missed you. It's me, Mar. We continued to text, catching up on our lives. At the time, I thought this was normal as I usually get texts from people from the camp trying to catch up and it was really nice hearing where they were in life. About nine texts in, after catching up on our lives, she suddenly asks, Will you go to prom with me? I dismissed it as strange because I thought she was probably desperate to get a date for prom, and me being about an hour drive away was a good distance. She lets me know the date of her prom, which I realize is the day after my prom, and the day before one of my concerts of an orchestra I was in at the same time. I let her know my situation, but she continues to try to convince me to go. Every day after, she continues to text me multiple times asking if I could go saying that I had time to go and that I should do it for her. I said yes in the end. 
I felt like she really wanted to date to prom for the experience, and I thought, why not? I would want the same if I were in her situation. What could go wrong? Three days later, I'm playing some games on my PC at the time when I hear my older sister yell the weirdest thing from downstairs. You girls here? Confused, I go to the window of my room and, what do you know? Mar is standing right in my driveway, smiling and waving at me. Sure, most people think, oh god, how did she find my address? How did she know I'm free? What? My stupid self instantly thought, oh crap, she drove an hour here, I feel kind of bad. I head outside to meet her to ask her why she was here and the first thing she said was, I drove an hour here, you should take me on a date. Behind me is my dad, approvingly shaking his head, and before I can say anything, he tells me to go. The man had such a proud look on his face, and that's when I started to realize that maybe this situation is kind of bad. Maybe. I take her out to a Chinese restaurant and decide to order three plates of food all for myself. I realize that maybe if I kept eating, I could decrease the time I had to talk as I'm chewing 75% of the time. To start off, she tells me stories about all the guys she's ever went after were taken by people she knew. She got increasingly mad as she kept talking to the point where people started to look. Suddenly she asks me about my relationship with this girl that I had a thing with a few months back. In my head, again, I think this is fine. She probably knows about that because she's friends with her friends. They probably told her. I explain my situation about how I don't talk to the girl anymore and Mar suddenly gets a flare in her eye. She asked me about what I plan to do from that time to college and if I'm interested in dating. I tell her I don't plan to do anything until college. After a few more places we go to because she said she wouldn't leave until she was satisfied with her time here, I go back to home and we decide to play games on my Wii. After a solid game of Super Smash Brawl, she realizes I'm not having fun and says, I guess you're kicking me out then proceeds to try to kiss me. Out of panic, I put my entire right hand on her face pushing her away, basically slapping her and giving her a face palm. I lead her out of my house into her car and once she gets in she starts to take pictures of me on her Snapchat story with the caption, First Date. I tell my parents about the situation I swear to god they literally brush it away saying, Oh, people can be like that, you should be happy a girl likes you. My sister slowly figures out that maybe this isn't good, but agrees with my parents because she thought it'd be funny to see how this went. Two weeks later of dodging her texts, of her asking to come over again, I'm heading to her pre-prom party. I am completely exhausted to the point where I could not run and I was just not ready for another prom. Surprisingly, the pre-prom party and the prom was a lot of fun. Mar did not do anything that made me feel uncomfortable and her friends were amazingly funny. After the prom, she takes me back to her friend's house. She then asks if I can stay the night, which I say I can't due to my concert that I have the day after. She then proceeds to get very angry and tries to push for it, so I text my sister help, and for the first time she comes to rescue me. An hour later, as Mar was getting increasingly madder, I get a call from my sister saying that she's outside. I let Mar know and I leave, so relieved that my day of prom with her was over. A few months later I get an anonymous letter in the mail addressed to me. Inside were three pages, filled front and back with a declaration of love from M. It explained how she fell in love with me at first sight, how everything I did made her love me even more, how she couldn't be without me. I meet up with a friend a few days later and he shows me his Snapchat conversations with her. It was just a wall of text, a wall of questions, asking personal questions about me. For the next year, while I was in college, I would get random texts and snapchats from her showing pictures of her coming into my town asking where I was. There were times when she would go to my town's high school games and send me pictures of our coaches with their jackets and the name of my town on there. Eventually, she stopped messaging me because I had blocked her on everything. Carrie has not had good luck with men. Honestly, I think her taste in men is pretty bad in general, but 
She is a great friend and lovely girl and deserves the best, which she was not getting from the idiots of dating past. So I was happy for her when she started dating Jack in college. Her roommate and a good friend at the time was dating a guy, and Jack was often the third and fourth wheel when the four hung out. So two good friends dating two good friends. I had never met Jack, but from descriptions and pictures, he sounded like a decent guy compared to the others. He was a bit of a bum. He didn't have a job and live with his parents, but he was genuinely nice and respectful, which was a positive change. And when he started dating Carrie, it seemed to lift him a bit out of his bad habits, and he got a job and began thinking about going to college. He wasn't the most attractive, and he was shy, so I think dating Carrie was his first relationship. I thought that relationships seemed pretty healthy. So they date for maybe nine months, and Carrie doesn't see the relationship going anywhere. Jack is definitely in a better place than when they started, but Carrie didn't enjoy certain things about him that seemed weird. For instance, he would smoke with his dad. Once Jack and Carrie were having a smoke together, and the dad comes home from work and joins them. I understand this is normal for some people, but unaccustomed to it, I think you can understand that it felt weird. Another thing that happened, which we joke about today, is that he tried to eat her boogers on two different occasions, and had a thing for wanting to stick his tongue in her nose. Weird. Gross. Also, I was once hanging out with them towards the start of the end of their relationship and made them into a household on The Sims 4, and when I asked him, what's your ambition, he got really offended. I explained it was part of the character creation process, but apparently he was angry about that and how rude I was for asking long after I left. Carrie eventually left him, but he begged and begged and convinced her to take him back. He even begged me to tell her to get back with him, saying, and I copied this from our chat, I'd rather die than give up on winning her back. They got back together, but the relationship didn't improve, of course, so a month or two later she tried again. He was devastated and mad, and particularly angry at me, because I was conspiring against him and was the one who convinced Carrie to break up with him. The reality being that when Carrie was avoiding him, she often used hanging out with me as an excuse to not have to be around him. So one day, Carrie heads back to her apartment after class and her front door is unlocked. Annoying, but her roommate was the type who forgot often. She gets into the apartment and it smells like smoke. Neither she or her roommate smoke, but her ex did. In her room, on her bed, she sees an umbrella that she did not own and thought she recognized. She ran out of the apartment and called me and spent the night on my futon. Jack had broken into her apartment when she wasn't home and been in her room. She is scared to contact him, so we decide to play it cool and casual like it didn't bother us, hoping to convince him to admit it. I ask him on Facebook Messenger, Hey, did you stop by Carrie's place the other day and forget an umbrella? He immediately gets defensive and asks if I think he's some sort of stalker. Yeah, that's not a red flag at all. Sometime later, a few months in fact, he still hasn't changed his Facebook status from in a relationship to single, or his profile picture which was a couple photo, and people have been contacting Carrie about it. She asks me to message him and he gets upset. He sends me an essay's worth of pent up feeling he has for her. Here is a quote I pulled up from the messenger that he sent me. I can't promise that it will completely leave her alone. Resisting the urge to talk to her has been the hardest thing I've ever done. You could always stop me from talking to her. Wednesday morning would be perfect. I'll be home sleeping. There's a gun in the silverware drawer. I'm sure you could get my address from Carrie. I told him to get psychiatric help. I did not tell Carrie about the messages because I did not want to upset her. Some parts of the messages were clearly meant for her and not me, but Jack was expecting that I'd share them with her and since she had blocked him, he thought I was a good way to get the message across. Eventually, about a month later, he called her from a new number and they had a long talk, and he was talking on the assumption that I had showed her the messages he sent me. I got some petty satisfaction that his plans didn't work out. My friend was a bit hurt that I had apparently been talking to him behind her back, but I told her that it was more like him just talking at me. I figured she was removed enough from the relationship to be okay reading the stuff that he had sent me and she understood. 
She was very disturbed. He had lied to her that he was anti-gun when they were together, so the gun might have been new. I'm glad that his shenanigans didn't cause beef with one of my best friends. I think he tried breaking into her apartment one last time after that and there were several drunk calls from his friend's phone. It died down slowly and harshly and painfully, but we haven't heard anything from him in the last couple of years since then, so thankfully that chapter is finally, it seems, come to a close. So I was raised in the suburb of Ramsey, New Jersey. I was around 10 to 11, so this probably happened around the summer of 2002. My aunt would go grocery shopping in the main shop right of town, but it was also in the same parking lot of this pretty big strip mall. So the parking lot was always packed. It was a hot summer day. I must have been out of school for summer because I distinctly remember spending the day at the pool with my aunt, which was right down the street from the shop right. She had to do some light grocery shopping, but of course the parking lot was packed. She parked all the way to the side of the shop right, so it was all the way in the back of the strip mall, but pretty vacant. I asked if I could stay in the car. She said I'd be too hot, but I said I'll just keep the windows rolled down. She agreed and said she'd only be a few minutes. Now I can't remember if this van was already there when my aunt pulled into the spot or if he pulled in after but I could only describe it as a dark-colored van, similar to a typical mom car. A man whose features had been totally wiped from my memory opened up the sliding side door and just sat at the edge of the opening. I remember noticing him just sitting there and smiling in my direction, and it already made me nervous. He was wearing normal summer clothes. Nothing about him was really frightening, but he was just sitting there. I wonder if that's why his face is lost to me. I tried not to look in his direction because it was just awkward. He started to go, Phew! And fanned himself dramatically. It really seemed like he was trying to get my attention, but I kept ignoring him. I had one of those cheap water toys where they were shaped like a mini Game Boy, and you would push a button, and a ring or shape would be pushed up, and you had to aim it into a little basket. Finally, he addressed me and said, it's so hot out, I can't imagine how hot you must be. I awkwardly nodded and said, Did you go swimming? He obviously noticed I was sitting on my beach towel and all I had on were shorts above my one-piece swimsuit. I said yes and awkwardly tried to focus on my toy. He leaned himself on their car. The windows were almost all the way rolled down and then he said, I have an AC, why don't you come wait in my car? Are you waiting for your mom? I said no thanks, but he kept insisting it was so hot in my car and I must be so miserable. It felt like forever. He was just trying to convince me to get out of the car. He also kept asking me who I was waiting for. I kept saying my aunt will be back. She just needed a few things. Eventually he must have gotten bored with me and shrugged and said, well, I hope you don't overheat in there, and closed the passenger door and sat in the front seat. He turned the car on and sat there for a bit more before he pulled away. I remember feeling so incredibly nervous and had that distinct anxious butterfly feel in my stomach. A second after he pulled away I saw my aunt not far up the lot with her groceries. I told her a man asked me if I wanted to sit in his car with the AC and wait for her and he was really annoying. She was like, what? You're lying. I insisted it happened, but she just looked confused and said I made it up in my head. To this day, she doesn't believe me and thinks the heat must have really gotten to me that day. I usually jokingly tell her she's lucky she didn't get arrested for leaving a kid in the car on a hot summer day. I still don't understand why the man didn't try harder to physically take me out of the car. I don't know if I understood what he was trying to do back then, but as an adult, the memory is chilling. The windows were rolled down and he could have easily unlocked the doors. I wonder if the busy parking lot literally saved me. If I had been forced out, I 100% would have caused a scene and for sure someone would have at least noticed. All I know is some guy back in 2002 thought he was smooth enough to convince a kid to jump in his minivan to enjoy his AC. I'm just grateful for whatever reason I didn't get out of the car. 
and hopefully he was never successful with whatever his intentions were. My outlook on people is not positive enough to think he truly was just trying to be nice to some kid on a hot day. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll bring you again soon.